So uh, basically what I want to talk today is I will introduce a very specific uh, questions in semantics of specific expressions, but I will try to use it as somehow as a, to introduce a bigger project that we have in different with different direction about how to model linguistic uh, causal language, and uh, so, so it will be a combination of specific puzzle to answer a specific puzzle, but I will try to make it also more substantial in explaining the whole the project as a, as a, as a whole. Uh, so I will start now with a very specific question, and then we will uh, move on. So there is. Uh, at some level of the presentation, uh, we would like to demonstrate that these two expressions, so if we speak about kill and cause to die, that they are somehow uh, related to each other. And various linguists in different ways try to capture it and to say that somehow both expressions, both linguistic standards of the crusade on uh, killed Mary, and if you say John caused Mary to die, somehow both sentences express a uh, cause of relation. And the question is whether we want to say, okay, there is something that we call cause, and we put it in different ex linguistic expressions, and somehow it is captured by this uh, by this notion of causality. Uh, now, if this is the truth. If this is the case, then there is a famous puzzle that somehow those two expressions are asymmetric in terms of uh, entailment. So if we say John killed the sherry, we can infer that John caused the sherry to die. But if we say John caused the sherry to die, we cannot infer that John killed the sherry. This is a known puzzle that if and now the puzzle behind it is the following. If basically what kill means is cause to die, there should be a symmetric, uh, a symmetric inferential nature to, between these two sentences, and this does not exist. Now, but on the other hand, it looks like the fact that there is an asymmetrical uh, cause of uh, the asymmetrical entailment relationship that somehow we can take kill to be a stronger uh, version of uh, cause to die because otherwise there won't be this asymmetric relation which would be so sometimes it works sometimes not but the fact that there is asymmetric relationship in terms of, of entailment it indicates that one of them is actually stronger than the other and one of them is a subset of, of the other now this leads us to actually ask like from the linguistic perspective we would like to say that we have to come with some semantic for the verb cause. And on the other hand, we need to come with some semantics for the lexical quality. So lexical quality will be those expressions of kill. That's in general the, the, a famous puzzle that is there in the literature for almost uh, six decades. Now, a common explanation is that somehow both implicate the notion of cause, but somehow if we take lexical quality or we take the verb to kill, and this would be the same way to take open and close to be open or something like that, that there, are, that there is an additional requirement of direct causation. And whatever it is, and we'll try to explain what what exactly it is that somehow when we say don't kill the sheriff there is a, a further requirement adding this uh this thing that it has to be more direct position as if we have a, a string a, a clear intuition of what it means to have a, to be direct position so basically the idea is that somehow we have the regular notion of causality in John Carlos Cherry to die, but then there is an additional uh, uh, 
element that is added there that is the direct position. And if this is the relationship, then we also get why there is asymmetrical uh, internal relationship between them because constant flux direct is stronger and therefore it always entails cause, but vice versa. It's not, it's not uh, working. Now, but the question is, it's not really clear how we should uh, capture the notion of direct causation. So there are various way how to speak about some, some notion of spatial temporal contiguity, or basically the idea is that there should be no intervening condition between the cause and the effect when this is actually what captures direct causation. So causality in general allows also some, if we think about some chain, then causality, uh, so we can actually think about causal relationship even when there isn't a spatial temporal contiguity, we still think about different elements on the chain as the cause of the result. But then for, in order to use verbs like Kill verbs like open or boil or I don't know, bake. All these things require something more. They actually requires to be a condition that is in the chain that is of the last one before the, the realization of the effect. Now, there are various problems to this in the literature that actually uh, demonstrate that. It's not completely true that we use this lexical causality only for the last condition. So if we think about, uh, so this is, these are examples from Milman and Bartlett Foot that they took the following sentence, opening bus lanes for motorcycles will redden the streets of London with, uh, what was it? Uh, with the list, list cyclist. cyclist blood or a large split of fast charging cars will melt a grid. In those cases, we actually think of that there is a longer chain causality that uh, the opening bus lanes will lead to increase an accident. And this is actually what will lead to some cyclists to die. Or if we think about uh, the case of the, of the car, so many electric cars on the roads, many cars charging simultaneously, high electricity demand, heating of electricity cables, and this will actually what lead to the melting of the grid, but still we don't have a problem to use to express actually one of the first element in the chain as the subject of this expression, which seems to be a, a counter examples for the, the rules of uh, direct causation. We expect a verb like uh, redden or verbs like melt to be like any other lexical quality at the end of the last one in the chain. And that will, that, that will, that, that's expectation uh, that only this will be allowed with this lexical quality. And as a matter of fact, we see that we can actually use something which is earlier on the chain of, the, of the, uh, causality to, to express, uh, to be expressed as a subject of this. Uh, linguistic expression. So this seems to be like counter counter examples to the claim that this expression should be expressed should express only direct accusation. Uh, now, I want to go back and to say, okay, so so this is in general a problem that we have uh, different. So, so at the moment we are in the same in a position that we have a claim in the literature that different positive expressions have different truth conditions. So they're not, they're not, not in detail with each other. And there was this idea that we can explain it by direct causation. Now I want to, to stop for a second and to think more broadly, what are we doing with the fact that we have differences between different positive expression. So we can think about, so in the same way that I demonstrated this, this fact that we have different uh, conditions to cause and to open, to close to open or to kill 
and to cause to die or to uh, and to bake and to cause the thing to be baked. We, we could actually bring many, many linguistic expressions like uh, because, or I will mention a bunch of them, and we could see that there are differences between them, between the truth conditions of different linguistic expressions that do not program reaction. Now, usually, uh, philosophers and people in cognitive science don't really take care about the linguistic expression. So there is this notion of causal relation, and then it should be expressed by the language, but the language itself shouldn't matter exactly which linguistic expression we, we use. And all of those actually supposed to denote this causal relation. So what are we doing with the fact that different linguistic expression have different uh, meaning or different truth condition? So one option, is to think, okay, maybe each one of them denote a different positive. So in philosophy and in cognitive science, we have this idea of pluralistic uh, causation, causal pluralistic approach to causation. So different philosopher propose that maybe we have more than one more than one notion of causality, maybe. We have on the one hand uh, productionist approach and then dependency approach. And similar way, various cognitive scientists propose that maybe we have different, in different contexts, we perceive causality in a different way. And then when it may be the reason why different linguistic expressions have different truth conditions, different causal relations, causal expressions have different truth conditions, might be the case that each one of them denote different notion of causation. This is something that we played with this idea several years ago, and maybe I should mention also uh, there is a paper by Copley and Walt that actually went along this way, but maybe each linguistic expression, the reason why different linguistic expressions have different truth conditions, different linguistic causal expression have different uh, truth condition has to do with the fact that each one of them denotes different notion of causality. This is one option. Another option is to propose that there is one to propose a uniform approach to causality, but basically to argue that each one of them has a different selection rules, which are different, and I will explain in a few minutes what it means. And this is the approach that we're going to take today. And the idea is that, we, and the, the approach that I'm going to suggest is that we have this way to model causal relations. And we will explain what exactly we mean by that. And then that somehow each linguistic expression is sensitive to something else that leads us within this same notion of causality to different. Uh, meaning or different truth condition for each of these expressions. But this, in order to, to follow this direction, we will have to do some uh, some more work. So we will take this, uh, our analysis take the linguistic expression of position to commonly presuppose structural equation models. And while adding construction specific entailment and pragmatic inferences, Parameters concerning the selection of a cause among the set of conditions, and all of this will become clear in uh, a few minutes. Uh, so, just to, to explain a little bit what we're doing. Uh, so, what is exactly uh, what exactly we, we, we let's go, go to the details, to the core. What do we mean by position? So. A very common uh, or if you take, I don't know, introduction, a class on causality, usually it starts with the first thing that you will read will probably be David Hume. And if you remember, for the philosopher among you, it was study, you speak about relations. He speaks about a different thing and then say, okay, we also have this notion of relation. And basically, causality is introduced as a binary relation between the, between the cause and effect. 
And later on, the Davidson, we know that this binary relation between two things is a relation between, between two events that somehow they hold this causal relation. And then it is reduced to different to other notions, either we speak about regularity or we speak about actuality, depending on which approach we take in uh, philosophy. Now, according to this, causal relation has the form C cos E, where C and E are events. Okay, so this is the ultimate notion of causality. And now, according to this, if this is what causality is, it's a binary relation between C and E, then uh, we should think about so causal expressions should somehow capture this. And in fact, if we you look in the linguistic literature, causal expression are so the definition of causal expressions is all the linguistic means, all the linguistic expression that denotes this relation. Like if you take typologies of positive constructions, Shibitani or many other words, they or Gauti when it speaks about it, says, okay, this is the notion that C cause E. We take it from philosophy, whatever it is, and we have this linguistic expression that somehow capture this binary relation between these two elements. Now, the claim that I would like to entertain is, and, and I'm not the first one, and actually the first philosopher said some of this time before, is that this binary relation is actually, uh, so the binary relation between C and E are featured only in linguistic expressions. So to reduce the notion of causality to, to, to a binary relation between cause and effect, which is basically the goal of many philosophical discussion. So this is actually only a feature of linguistic expressions. So linguistic expressions have this shape that they have two things. One that we mark as the gods, and the other one which marks the effect. But causation itself is never a binary relation. Causality is actually a, a way more support. But, or at least it shouldn't. There isn't any requirement that this will be something between two things. The requirements of these two things, this is actually a linguistic phenomenon. So when all the discussion that we have about what, how to reduce this binary relation to other terms, it's actually a work in linguistics and semantics, how to capture the meaning of specific expression. But this is, when we do this, we don't do it in physics. When we do this, we do semantics. And then we have to understand actually what we do when we do with the physics and also how exactly we do it when we do linguistics. So what exactly, how we capture the meaning of these expressions when we do semantics and what is the relationship between the metaphysics of causation and the semantics, how we put those, those two things together. Now, I already mentioned several times, and I want to go for a second back and ex explain. So what are, what do I have in mind when I speak about linguistic expression of causality? So in languages, we have various ways that we can actually capture causality. We can use the verb verbs like cause, or we can use make, or allow, or enable, or get, all this expression somehow captures this notion of causality. They say, he made me go. We somehow see this, that there is like some causal relation between what he has done and what I do. Or we have this thing about the vectors, like because of, from, or as a result of, all those expressions are also somehow capture this notion of causality. I will say in a few seconds what exactly mean that. Or you can be chain of statements like open, void, or in some languages we have certain morphology to mark causality. So, for example, 
in Hebrew, people will say, Yichil is actually a marker of causality. And in other languages, we have a morphine, various morphemes that somehow are associated with a causal relation. Now, these are the linguistic expressions. What put them, why I take all, what will be the criteria to consider all of them as causal relations? So, as positive expression. So in classical uh, typological work, they will say, okay, they denote causality. But now I'm actually, I don't want to actually say that because I don't know what it means to denote causality. So basically, I will take them to be a linguistic construction, which can be divided into three parts using the working definition. We examine the nature of the following relation in various construction. So basically they have the three elements. We identify one element as the cause. We identify one element as the effect of that cause. And then we denote some, we identify something that capture this independency thing. Now, I want to be clear. When I use this, cause and effect are used here loosely in a pre theoretical manner. So it's basically enough for me that I actually somehow capture this relation that I can identify one element as cause, one element as something that is resulted from the first one, and that there is some connection but I'm still not committing at all to what exactly is this relation. So when we employ the, cause, the term positive or when we divide the component of cause and effect, it does neither indicate that we assume that such construction denotes cause and relation, nor does it commit to the nature of the cause and effect. So we, didn't, we don't know if they must be events or must be proposition or must be individuals. We don't commit this is actually what we're trying to do. So in fact, it's quite the opposite. We use C and E and D in an uncommitted manner as it's our goal to understand the nature. So this is this is the data. We work with this. This is the data of this is the material we are working with. And now we try to actually attempt to understand what makes them or what actually is the dependency that is expressed by this uh, linguistic expression. So now just to summarize, we said this binary relation, this is a linguistic phenomenon. And now we took, this is the, the linguistic phenomenon that we have, that we identify that have this binary relation between cause and effect. Now the next step is to go back and say, okay, so what is position itself? Or what is, or what we try to capture by this notion of causality. So let's go back to classics and to clarify what do I have, what, what do I mean when I say that causation is not a binary relation and it goes back to stuff from Mill and many other people who actually said the following. Uh, causation is seldom, if ever, between a consequent and a single antecedent, okay? But usually between a consequent and the sum of several antecedents, the concurrence of all of them being requisite to produce the consequent. In such cases, it is very common to single out one only of the antecedents under the denomination of cause, dealing, uh, calling the other merely condition. So what, what do we have in mind here? Basically, if we think about, um, oh, I, you know, we can actually uh, demonstrate several examples. Okay, so if we think about opening the door, let's say I'm pressing the button and the door is open. So for this to happen, we may say that I press the button, this cause the opening of the door. I can say that I open the door. But as a matter of fact, we need several conditions to happen. We need electricity to run. We need that. There will be a close of the circuit. And we also need that the, lock, the door will not be locked, will be unlocked. 
So all these preconditions together lead to the opening of the door. So then one of them, so all this, so when we think of what actually led or produced the opening of the door, and that is responsible for the opening of the door, we need all three conditions. We may pick one of them as, as we will say, the pressing of the button causes opening of the door or open the door. But this in this, by this, we select one of the conditions as to be the cause. But as a matter of fact, that if we ask what leads to the, or what is the cause of the opening of the door, we need all, all those things. So the, so the binary relation that we have at the end between pressing the button and opening the door, this is a, after a selection among the various conditions, which one of them is the cause. Okay. Now, having said that, okay, so what, what I'm going to do now, I will introduce, I will start a little bit informally and introduce a notion of structural equation models. And then I'll speak about Mackey's notion of Inus condition within the framework of structural equation models. And then I will, and then I will speak about the semantics of the verb cause versus the semantic of lexical causative. So we'll come back to the question that we started with. And what can we learn from this? And then I will do it a little bit more formally. And I will introduce the notion of causal sufficiency. And in fact, I will introduce two notions of causal sufficiency. So that's that's the goal. The goal, so so far we came, so what we have, to, I'll summarize what we saw so far. We have this phenomenon, linguistic expression, express causality. We know it. That they don't have a say. So, on the one hand, the idea is that somehow they express causality. On the other hand, they express causality. Each one of them has a different meaning. So, we ask ourselves, okay, how come if they express causality, they have different meaning? One option is to say they express different notion of causality. The other option would be to actually think of causation. Not as a binary relation between two elements, but as having all these elements together that leads to the result, and that each linguistic expression pick have different rules about how to pick the various among the conditions which one can be the cause. But at the essence, causality is the same because causality is this model of all the elements together. And the difference is between the different expression is about how to pick specific expression from this larger model. Okay. Now we will try to do it in a systematic way that we will be able to actually see the inferential relationship between. The various constructions, and also that it will be something we can actually capture formally. That's the goal. Okay. So I will start by a little bit, in order to be able to do it formally, or in order to be able to capture it in a computational way, I will start with structural equation. Now, before that, oh, no, I need to. <laughs> Play with this this way now. Uh, I think it will be easier. Yeah, we'll just be fine. Uh, so usually, just to clarify something because it will be a little bit tricky. Uh, what? So that's I that's your name as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you can say stupid things. I'll make sure that they will it's you if. Uh, if this I will, yeah. okay. So I, I just want to clarify. So usually we think about this. So two notions that come up in the literature is necessity and sufficiency. And I want to make sure that we're not confused. So necessity is usually a cause is necessary for an effect. If the condition did not take place, the result will not 
take place. This is actually the notion of the fractality. So if C were not a curve, you would also not a curve. And often sufficiency is actually captured this way that the cause is sufficient for an effect E if when C happen, E also the effect, when the cause happens, the effect also happens. So if C were the effect, E would also. This is not, and I will in a few seconds we'll clarify these are actually so sufficiency will need a different definition because and, and you will see we will see in a second one. Okay. So now, what are structural equation models? So we represent causal dependency in a structure, causal model containing the set of propositional variables and truth values. Basically, causation in this approach is not between events, is actually a way to compute uh, the rela relationship between the truth values or the values of propositions. And basically, we we'll try to say that the fact that some variables depend on other for their value is represented by a structural equation. So basically, the idea is the following. I can actually show it. So let's take this example that we had before of how we open an electric door. We need, we can actually open the door in a different way. We have a handle that can actually influence it. We need the door whether the door is locked or unlocked. And then we have pressing button and we have a circuit and we have electricity that runs. So we can basically take each one of them to be a proposition. The, the button is pressed, that circuit is closed, the handle is pressed, the, un, the door is locked or unlocked. And then if it's true, it's one. And if it's false, it's zero. So these are the relationship. But we also know that if there is an intelligent relationship, that if the button is pressed, if, if the button is one, then the circuit goes to one. And this is actually what is captured by these errors. Or if we have a single kit running as one, electricity one, unlock as one, then details the way. So basically, we take all these true, all these conditions to be propositions, and we know how exact what the relationship with, with, between them, how we can from which knowledge we can entail the knowledge of other propositions, and it's basically captured in this way. Now And now I will actually try to, so for those of you who know magical philosophy to be it is known, but I will actually show how we can translate Mackie. And for those of you who really don't, I will, I will explain in a second. And I, for those of you who know who Mackie's approach to causation, I will just actually show how we can translate it to a structural equation model. So Mackie demonstrated that basically. If we take this model, causality, each of this element is an Einus condition. What does it mean Einus condition? So Einus condition is insufficient, but necessary alone, but together unnecessary, but sufficient. So if we take circuit on its own, it is necessary. We need it in order to open the door. But it's not enough. It's not sufficient in order to open the door. If we, need, if we want to open the door, we will need a certain set here together that is expressed here. And together they are necessary but sufficient. So we will see in a second what, why it's important, why this is important. Uh, so what basically the idea is that we have different sets which are sufficient. So this three together sufficient to open the door, these two are sufficient. So each one of the sufficient set is sufficient but unnecessary because there is another way of to open the door. And on the other hand, each element on its own is insufficient because it is part of a larger set, but only together 
they are sufficient. So the important thing here, so circuit indicates sufficiency. And the important thing here, and this is why I decided with the definition of sufficiency, sufficiency is not a characteristic of individual conditions. This is a characteristic of set of conditions. Okay, this is very, very important. So somehow people are a little bit confused. Sufficiency is never appropriate in a specific condition. It's always a property of an entire set. Okay. Now, is it clear or should I? So basically, now we take it as a. So I'll jump for a second. But if you take it, you can actually take it as a logical system. Okay. So uh, I'll come back to this later. But the point is, I, I'm jumping ahead for something else. But uh, I will go come back to all of this in a second. We can actually translate it to truth tables. Okay. These are not these are truth tables, of, not of connectives, logical connectives, but this is, it works exactly in the same way that the truth table works because we basically match the relationship between this element and the results, whether it's zero or one. So this is the causal model. The causal model is a way to capture the relationship between different uh, conditions. Okay. Now, Mackie said the following. Okay, so Mackie actually proposed the following for the semantics of the verb cause. It's actually interesting to be reading. Uh, I recommend he actually works about the semantics of the verb cause. And he says that when we say A is cause P, it means that A is at least an minus condition of P, that is, there is a necessary and sufficient condition of P which has one of these forms. A was present at the occasion in question, so it actually was there. The factors were presented by X, if any, in the formula for the necessary and sufficient condition were present on the occasion in the question. So meaning that all the step actually was there. Not only, so when we say he opened the door, it's not only that he pressed the button, it's also we assume that there was electricity and that the door was unlocked. And there was no other sufficient set in this uh, in this time. Okay, that's uh, I, I'm, I'm doing it quickly, but we'll, it will be important for later on. Okay, so now this was for the verb cause. Now let's think about lexical cause. So if we think about the context of automatic door, which of the sense of the following sentence can better describe it? So we say. John pushing the button or the button or John open the door or electricity open the door. Which one of them is better? A. A. How can we change it? What would make B better? When we will be able to say electricity open the door? You had a problem with electricity today, so you may actually uh, have a case in which you, we can say electricity open the door. Let's say this morning you press the button, you did everything, but there was no electricity. And then electricity is back in the door is opening, then you would say electricity opening. So once electricity is uh, imagine applying the same model at left to a different scenario, John pushes the, and holds down the button, but nothing happened because of a momentary power outage. When power returns, the door opens. Then in this case, we'll be able to say uh, electricity opened the door. So what matters seems to be the last row, the condition of complete sufficient set. So remember this idea of completion of a sufficient set, and you will see in a second why this is important. So lexical positive, we, I will argue, uh, select the completion event, the condition whose occurrence at time t completes a sufficient set, ensuring that the effect occurs. Prior to this event, that t, the sufficient set, did not hold an occurrence of the effect was not determined. And thus, when the temporal order of events is retrievable contextually, a lexical positive must express the completion event, then will be the electricity. Okay, so 
to clarify, the idea will be to go back to those cases in which the element earlier in the chain can actually be the subject chain of statements. The idea will be that somehow they already complete a sufficient set. Okay, and I will explain in a few minutes. So we will need this formal. What I will try to show you is that we have different types of sufficient set, and, and each one of them completes a sufficient set, therefore, they can be uh, they can be actually the subject of a sentence of with chain of statements. And the idea is that in most cases, the last one is a completion of a sufficient set, but when there is a deterministic chain, this is already a completion of set. With certain definitions of sufficiency, we will get that everything else in a deterministic chain can be a complete a sufficient set, and we'll have different sufficient set. And each one of them, if it completes a sufficient set, it can be the subject of chain of state verbs. And what happens is that we and phenomenally always think often think that the last one, this is the notion of direct causation, because often they are the one that completes a sufficient set. But when you have a long chain of deterministic chain, then early on we already complete a sufficient set. Uh, okay. I will show it a little bit more uh, informally in a second. Uh, but the, what do we learn from this? We learn that causal statements do not assert what the causal model is. They presuppose it. So basically, we have, when we say John opened the door, we're not saying John caused opening of the door. We rely on what we know about the causal model. And basically, we will see in a second what we use from this causal model. But the, the point is that when linguistic causative commonly assert binary relation between cause and effect, they may nevertheless reflect inferences about more complex causal relations. And we will see in a second what do I mean by that. OK, so in order to do that, now we move to formal machinery uh, to, to introduce causal models and to capture this notion of necessity and sufficiency and sufficient sets and all those things which are required for our semantics of this uh, causative expressions. Okay, so this is actually what we start. We start with this. This is the causal structure. Causal structure is a set of proposition letter P is the uh, sorry, uh, set of proposition letter P is a directed acyclic graph in which each node corresponds to a distinct element of P and each link represents direct functional relationship among the corresponding variables. So basically, we just start with a fix with these graphs. But these graphs are not enough because it only tells enough of the relationship. And they can't really, we don't know what the graphs themselves tell us. Because we don't know if we need a conjunction of them or each one of them separately. So we need to do something that will tell us how to interpret these graphs. So for this, we need a model. So a model is a pair of uh, causal structure D and a set of parameters compatible with D. The parameters to the assign a function to each proposition in P, where the sigma is a set of appearance of psi and D. So what, what do we have, what exactly do we have here? Basically, we start with some knowledge about the word, set of propositions that tell us the right set of proposition are either true or false. And then, giving the model, we know, giving what we know about sigma, there is a truth, there is a value to each proposition in the sentence. 
in the in the model. So basically, for example, if we come with the knowledge, with this knowledge, we will get to the value of the door or the preposition the door is open, but it's either one or zero. Now, basically, there are two ways how to compute. Either comes with a true advice, or if so, if it's among the if those propositions are among those that we actually know about them before, we get the true. We get value, but if it's not part of it, then the model should give us a truth value. And the truth value can be one of three, it can be either zero or one or undefined. Now, this is a, cl a, a cleaning uh, uh, approach to the truth condition, but it's uh, epistemological. So, you here means we don't know. So, the part of what the cosmic structure should give us is it's basically about our knowledge of the world. So based on what we know, what we can infer. And part of us, part of the knowledge is also that if we don't know about certain value, we can still have knowledge about other things. So we will see in a second that sometimes when we don't know, we don't know what the result, but sometimes let's put I just clarify in a second, okay, just to give you a sense. Even if I don't know if there is electricity in the building or not, but I, if I know so about electricity, the value is you. We don't, it's undefined. But if I know that the door is locked, I can actually infer that the door is not open. So we can make inferences even in situation of when we don't know. Okay. Now I'll explain the challenge. The challenge is the following. It's very hard to capture this notion of Einstein's condition. Why? Because necessity is defined as the Einstein's condition. Can I can yes. the chat? Because necessity is defined within a sufficient set, and the sufficient set is defined on a set of necessary conditions. So it's actually there is circularity in this definition that it's hard. we need something to start with to get this definition. Otherwise, we get into circularity because we, we need a set of necessary condition, but the necessity of each of the condition is defined within its set. So this is the problem, and I will try to see to demonstrate how we pass this problem. So we start with a situation. What is a situation? Situation is a set of propositional variables sigma and their value is a situation. So basically this is a situation. Situation S tells us that A, the value is one, B is zero, C is one, D is one. So this is what, this is like what we think about the word. If we try to think about the possible situation, that we can have with the door, it's basically a situation of certain position and their value. That's it. So it's a variable and their value. Now, before we start speaking about necessity and sufficiency, we just speak about causal relevance. What do I mean by con by relevance? If we take this, I'll, I'll start by illustration and then I'll show the details. We know that all these four together, as a situation that has all of them, is relevant for the value of the Okay? We know that if we know this, we know what the value of the The problem is that this is too much information because we actually don't need this in order to know the value of this. Or we don't know this too, in order to know the value of this. But I want to take, but so at first I care about cause of relevancy, and only then I will care about necessity and sufficiency. So, how do I capture this? A situation S 
consisting of a set of pair of proposition variables sigma in P and the values of M this is in a specific model is causally relevant for a certain value of the variable C, C when in the interpretation of psi with respect to the model is defined one or zero when the complementary set of sigma in P assign U for all its variables. So the idea is the following. First, relevancy is for a certain value. It's not for any value, and I don't have time now to explain why it's important, but it's for a specific value, whether it's one or zero. So we have a model for one, and we have a model for zero. We have sorry, causal relevancy for one. And for, for, it's not for just not it's not for different propositions. But the point is the following: we take those four and we say, okay, let's have now the weather, and we put u to the weather. Based on that, do we know whether the door is open? So what we know now that this all all those things together are relevant. Because even if we don't know what the weather is not today, we know whether the door is open. Okay? So now we know that everything here, so this combination together is relevant because we will know whether the door is zero or one, whether, so whether it's one or not. But we don't know if we capture the notion of necessity and sufficient. Now we can move on and have the definition of necessity. So in order to capture the notion of necessity, uh, it's actually, we, che we check for a specific condition whether it's necessary for the result. The way we do it is we take a situation that is causally relevant for the proposition variable. And this is, the, it allows us to, to ignore the value of all the other lectures which are not part of the situation. And then we take the interpretation of this situation and of, of the set of the variable sigma of M in situation S and of another uh, set, which is basically, I'll, I'll make it simple. We take two minimal sets but there is only one difference between them, whether the value of one condition, and we check whether it affects the results. If it affects the result, then this is the necessary condition within this set. So if we go back to this equation, you will realize but if the minimal pair of the two sets is that one, this one is A is one, A is zero, we will still get the door is open. So this is not a necessary condition within this set. But if we have only this one, then we will realize that each element here affects the result because we will take minimal pair, B1, B0 and B1 to affect whether the door is open or not. We'll take C1 and C0 to affect uh, and in the situation of, we don't have, in the causal relevant situation, we don't have zero. So this is how we capture the notion of necessity. By this, we actually have a very strict way to define possible words. So basically, each line here is a possible word. So now we don't need to come like feeling like Lewis had about possible words or the way that sometimes semanticists have feeling about possible words. We actually, this is the definition of possible words. Each line is a possible word. Also, uh, oh, I didn't send you the latest one. Uh, necessity here is very similar to Lewis counterfactuality, but not, but it's only similar, but it's very different. Because basically, in Lewis' way of capturing counterfactuality, you take a minimal pair. But for him, counterfactuality is in actual position. 
And here, this is not about actual correlation. This is about the space of possible of possible uh, work. So it's actually necessity here is defined in the mapping of the relationship between words, and it's not about a specific case of causal judgments. But if you want, I can talk about it later. So basically, we can take uh, we can capture all the relationship between those words in this way. And uh, hmm. okay, what I want to demonstrate here is because I'm running out of time. So what I want to demonstrate here is that we actually have various sufficient set. Oh, sorry, sorry. So now, what is a sufficient set? A situation S is defined as a sufficient set for a certain definition of psi if the set of variables sigma whose value are defined in S is causally relevant for a certain value of psi and all members are causally necessary for that value of psi. So if we have a set, once we define this uh, causally relevant set, and we realize that each of its member is necessary to the result, then this is a sufficient thing. Now, we started with, so now we go back to the semantic of cause. The semantic of cause is basically, according to Mackie, and we will at the moment we'll take it, it basically says the following, that it's enough, and I'll say the words and then I can show you how to fit it here, but it basically tells us this thing is a member of a sufficient set. It, it, and, and no other sufficient set occurred in this context. Okay, so basically we take a condition, we have a sufficient set, and we say this condition is a part of the sufficient set, and it actually happened, and no other sufficient set is took place, and this is the classical definition of causation. Sorry, yeah. I'm connecting the way of capturing causation. Now we go back to lexical positive, and this is the point that I was trying. I want to make here, so I'll do it a bit slower. So basically, we will take events to be uh, variables, moment in which. There is a change in values for proposition. So if I press the, if I open the door, it has to, if I by pressing the button, it means that there was a moment in which it was zero before and then became one. And then we can identify the event which complete a sufficient set. So this is a moment. So we take uh sufficient set and we have a condition that is part of it and there is an event in which it is true but there is no time before that that the result could take place so this is indicated this is the last one in which um, among the set so this is the last event that was completed. Now, what do we gain by that? I did a whole tour and now I will explain to you what, what do we get there. As we could see, I can say both well, the pushing of the button open the door and I can say the closing of the circuit open the door. Okay, do you agree with me that I can say both sentences in English? Yeah, people in general think both of them. Now, if we have this notion of direct causation, only this one should be fine for this data. According to what I according to the definition we had, both the Closing of the circuit and pushing the button complete the sufficient set. How? 
they both complete the sufficient set because we have different sizes of sufficient set. Each one of them actually follow the definition that we have of the sufficient set. Because each in each, so we have this big sufficient set, we have this is a sufficient set, and also, uh, yeah, and this is one also a sufficient set. But the point is that basically we can also take just the blue one to be a sufficient set. How do we do that? Why do we can do that? Because if we have all those three without a circuit, each one of the conditions is necessary. And if all of them occur, we know that the result will take place. Because the relationship between the button and the circuit is deterministic. So we, we can actually skip this. So according to this way, we need a sufficient, there are many, many sizes of sufficient size. And this is why we can cap when there is a deterministic relationship on the chain, each one. We have different sizes of sufficient set and di a different one which completes sufficient. Set. This is why we could actually have those this variation in uh, uh, what should I do? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. This is the way that you actually tell me to finish the talk. <laughs> okay. I will I will stop here. You know, I, I have more. If you if if you have other questions, I can actually clarify. But I will just summarize. Uh, I have more a little bit things, various things to, to fix here. If if you have the problems, but I can I would I just want to summarize what this this what we saw. Basically, the idea is that if you ask me what position he is, this is position. Okay, or this is position. Meaning. We, as part of our knowledge, we know which condition in the world leads to which condition in the world. If something happened, a combination of certain facts, certain situations lead to certain situations. So if you want to take a binary relation, the binary relation is between sets, is between situations. Between sets of proposition and their values and another proposition of this value. This is what position is. This is our mental representation if you want a causal form. Now we need to know which, so we, now we have various ways, various linguistics way to indicate, to, to express the relationship between certain conditions and the result moving. We want to express them. But each linguistic expression has a different rules, which among the conditions we can pick to be the C of this specific expression. So have, knowing that this is an effect and knowing that these are the conditions that are necessary for the result, different linguistic expression have different requirements, which one can be picked. Some of them basically say we just want it to be a necessary condition. That's a very cost. Some of them requires to be the one that completes sufficient set. And they actually don't care which one, which of the sufficient sets. Some of them may require, I don't know, other logical relationship. Maybe they will add also pragmatic stuff like the thing which is normal or abnormal. Or the thing which is unexpected. There can be many, many other things that you will add. But basically, the notion of position is this one. The differences between the, the reverse expression is about the rules of which of the elements, which of the conditions can be can be selected. Okay. And this is how, and, and what I try to demonstrate. That we actually take this puzzle, a long standing puzzle in semantics, and it can be actually captured once we have this way of 
this approach to look at causal relationship between uh, sentences. Uh, yeah, I think I can basically stop here.